Tonight, I want to teach about the, the mystery of Melchizedek. And I'm going to just touch a little bit on it. Uh, and we will stop where we can stop. Uh, there's a lot of um, mysteries about who Melchizedek is. There's some people who say that Melchizedek is the pre-incarnation of Christ. Uh, some people believe that Melchizedek was uh, a priestly, uh, you know, it was a priest of an old order uh, that was on this earth prior to Adam and Eve uh, being put in the garden, that God put a priest on earth. Uh, because before God deals with man, he always has a priest. He always puts a priest in place before he can deal with people. There has to be an intermediary. Uh, but when Christ came, he abolished that priestly ministry, uh, relying on one single person to be a priest. Uh, and he made as royal priesthood. He made as a royal priesthood a chosen people, a peculiar people, a, a, a royal people, a people of God, we have been made a royal priesthood. So being that now you're a priest, you can minister to God. But we can go back again to the Old Testament, uh, to the uh, time of Abraham, and find this uh, personality called Melchizedek. Now, if you read Hebrews chapter 6 from verses 19 to 20, he says that Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He says, Christ Jesus, after his resurrection, became the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, a lot of people will have problems with that because if Christ is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, then it means that he fits into the prerogative or it fits into the requirement of a Melchizedek priesthood. A Melchizedek priest has no father, has no mother, and has no origin. Okay, so if Melchizedek has no genealogy, he has no origin, he has no father, he has no mother, Christ is called a priest in the line of Melchizedek. That means that Jesus has no mother, he has no father, he has no origin, which means the father is him. In Isaiah, he is called the everlasting, you guys don't read your Bibles. Jesus is called in Isaiah who? The everlasting, the mighty, you sing that song, the mighty God, the everlasting, wait a minute. Jesus is called the everlasting father. How many everlasting fathers do we have in heaven? So if he's called the everlasting father, who is he? Okay, let me explain it again like I did earlier. All right? Inside of you, there's a spirit, right? As I'm talking to you right now, what part of me is speaking? My spirit is speaking and my soul is expressing what my spirit is speaking, right? The body that is standing here is just the instrumentation to issue the words out. But the words that I'm speaking are proceeding from my spirit through my soul. So Jesus is the soul of God it is the word. It is the expression of the Father. The physical body that walked on earth was the instrument of accomplishing the purposes of the Spirit through the Son. And when people saw him doing miracles, it was the Father inside of him doing the work through the soul and the body that was carrying these two personages. So that's why when you go to John chapter 1 verses 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which means the Father and the Son were united. They were, they are, they are not being separated. They, they, they were, the Hebrew word is hikad, which means the Lord your God is hikad. The Lord your God is one. The Lord your God is united. So the, the unity of the Father and the Son was so one, to the point where when the son wanted to leave the father, 
to come on earth, he, 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 he says, Lo, the volumes of the book are written about me. I'm here to do your will. He says, a body you have prepared for me. So the father prepared a physical body. That physical body was the one called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then God chose to enter into that body, all right, so that he can express himself to humanity. So the father was inside of him. That's why when John asked him, show us the father, he says, you've seen me, you've seen the father. The father is inside of me. I don't do anything less the father shows it to me. The father lives in me. The father dwells in me. I and my father are one. He's talking about the unity of the spirit and the soul. And the result of what you're seeing is from the unity of the spirit and the soul. I, I tried my best to explain it to you in a layman way of understanding. It, it can get really complicated. But listen. If Jesus is a priest, according to Melchizedek priesthood, then he was the father in the flesh. He has no origin because he's called Logos in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, which means it is Logos. If you study the word Logos, Logos means eternally existent, which means he has always existed before the foundations of the earth. So Jesus did, did not have a beginning. He has always existed. He was the Lamb of God crucified before the foundations of the earth. So even before the foundations of the earth, he was already crucified. We saw it 2,000 years later on, but he was already crucified in eternity. What was that crucifixion in eternity? That's when the Father and the Son decided to separate. Why? Because the Father knew that humans would make a mistake. So he separated with the Son with an anticipation to begin sending the Son on earth with a physical body. That's why in the Old Testament, it is the Melchizedek. That's why he is the angel of the Lord. That's why he is the captain of the Lord's host. That's why he is the angel that Abraham gave food and he ate. He appeared in a physical form. So before eternity, the separation took place. Why? Because God wanted to identify himself with the Israelites. So he, he showed up as a pre-incarnate Christ. Now, he was a priest of the Most High God. Now, we turn quickly to Genesis chapter 14. There is a war between the ancient city states in Canaan in Mesopotamia. And Abraham's nephew, Lot, had been uh, captured. And he and his family and goods were cut it off. All right? And one of, their, one of their number escaped and brought news to Abraham, who armed, Abraham was able to arm 318 of his own servants, and he began to pursue the invaders to what was later named as Dan and beyond, or the camp of Dan and beyond. Then Abraham rescues Lot and his family, returns them safely to the Canaanite cities, and on Abraham's return, a man of mystery, Shows up all of a sudden to the scene. And Abraham was ministered to by Mel Melchizedek. Now, he's called a priest forever. He is a priest forever before God. Jesus is also called a priest forever. How many priests do you need in heaven? So Jesus and Melchizedek are one thing. Amen? Amen? Now, let's go a little bit deeper. So here's the account. Melchizedek, this is uh, Genesis chapter 14 from verses 18 to 20. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God most high. And he, Melchizedek, blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham by the most high, maker of the heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him, Melchizedek, a tenth of everything. That is a tithe of all things. For the tithe means a tenth of everything. Where did, the, why did, where did Abraham get the concept of tithe? Because the law had not been established by Moses. So where did he get the idea of tithing? Was this a revelation that came to Abraham in that moment? That he needs to give 10% of everything that he owned to, to Melchizedek? Notice that Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which is the city of Jerusalem. Now, Salem comes from the Hebrew word peace. 
but realize that when these things are happening, Israel has not been instituted as a nation. They are still not a nation. So, it's called Salem, or the king of peace. So, Melchizedek is called king of peace. Who is the prince of peace in the Bible? All right, you're beginning to get it, all right? So, that Salem means peace. So, that will make Melchizedek the king of peace. And in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 2, the Hebrew name Melchizedek itself, it also means king of peace righteousness who is the king of righteousness all right we are getting it okay so that same same individual this mysterious person is mentioned in psalms 110 verses 4 listen to what he says speaking prophetically of christ david states this the eternal has sworn and he will not repent thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This verse is quoted again where? In Hebrews chapter 5 from verses 6 to 10. So David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, prophesies that Jesus is a priest forever. Remember Melchizedek is also called a priest in perpetuity. So that means that Melchizedek and Christ are priest forever well too bad you cannot have two priests in heaven there's only one so that means that melchizedek was another form that god chose to appear to abraham in the old testament uh, uh, abraham and the king of the wicked sodom knew exactly who he was so they must have seen him before because they can't call him, they can't call him a king of Salem and be able to offer him the sacrifices if they have not seen him before and they have not known him before. So it seems like Abraham and the king of Sodom knew who this personality was. One of the other hints that we talked about before um, proceed from the revelation of the land of Canaan from the ancient times before the days of Moses. It was known uh, among the Gentiles as the divine land or the holy land, the land of the place of worship. Why was there someone in the holy land who was divine, holy, and worthy of worship? That was the personality of Melchizedek. But we can clear this mystery very quickly by looking at Hebrews chapter 7 from verses 1 to 2. Let's look at that quickly. So when you come to Hebrews chapter 7, you find Melchizedek identified and he says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. Wow. Let's read it again. For this Melchizedek, king of peace, translation king of Salem, king of peace, priest of the Most High God. So Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. And he met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. And he blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. King of righteousness, and after that, king of peace. So listen to this combination of names. It is called the king of righteousness, and he's also called king of Salem, which is also king of peace. So according to Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 2, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him to whom Abraham gave 10% of his tithe. King of righteousness. Think of it. King of righteousness. Jesus himself says this, there is none good but one, that is God. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, Jesus says that there is none good but one, that is God. Human self-righteousness is before God, a what? A filthy rag or a menstrual cloth. So Jesus says the human righteousness is like a menstrual cloth or a filthy rag before him. So there's no single human being that can qualify to be king of righteousness except who? Jesus. The one who imputed righteousness 
upon us. So upon your salvation, Jesus came and he entered into your spirit and he imparted, he imparted a spirit of righteousness inside of you. So now we can stand before God, not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of who? The person called Jesus, King of Salem, right? So no one can be righteous but God. Or one that is made righteous by God's power. So this expression that we find there in King of Salem and King of Peace, it cannot be applied to any person. It will be blasphemous to apply that to any human being. Why? Because righteousness is the obedience to God's law. And Jesus was the fulfillment of who? The law. All right? So only God could be righteous and only God could impart his righteousness in a human being. All human beings have sinned and broken the law of righteousness according to Romans chapter 3 verses 23. So to continue in Hebrews chapter 7, we begin also to note something about him. He's called the Prince of Peace or the King of Peace from which Jerusalem was named Peace. The King of Shalom or the King of Peace. And remember, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. So no human being can also be called King of Peace. Except who? Christ. So Melchizedek and Christ begin to look alike, right? <sighs> Men know not the way of peace, according to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and verses 17. Because he says there's none righteous, not even one. And the way of peace they have not known. So we begin to rule any human figure qualifying to be Melchizedek or king of Salem, king of peace. All right? Now, Melchizedek also was without mother, without father, without descent, or as Philip's translation, if you read the, the Bible, the Philip's translation, he says it, he had no father or mother or family tree. He was not born as a human being is born. He was without father and mother. Without origin. Now, according to Ezra chapter 2, verse 62, you could not serve as a priest without a record of where you came from. Every priest was traced down to a lineage. That's why Zechariah is found in the temple in the time of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus has to restore priesthood. Because Melchizedek gave priesthood to Abraham. Abraham gave the priesthood to the Levitical priesthood. Levitical priesthood translated later on into Aaronic priesthood. The last order of priest at the time of Jesus was Zechariah in the temple. And Zechariah happens to be the father of John the Baptist, who is at the prime age of a priest. Jesus does not go to Caiaphas because Caiaphas is a false priest. He goes to the real priest in the wilderness baptizing people. John being born out of Zechariah's family meant that John is the rightful priest. So Jesus goes to John and says, you baptize me. <laughs> and John says, well, I can't do it, you know. <laughs> I can't even untie the shoelaces. Jesus says, do it for righteousness purposes. What did he mean by do it for righteousness purposes? Jesus knew that only the priest, only the rightful priest can lay hands on him and put him underneath that water. Because when John did that, John transferred the priesthood to the one who had it in the beginning. And then when he died on the cross and he rose again, he gave us the priesthood. Tell somebody, I am a priest of God now. So you can see how God traced down the priesthood. But it says here that Melchizedek has no father. He has no mother. He has no origin. And if Jesus is a priest according to the Melchizedek order, then he has no father. He has no mother. He has no origin. Which means Mary did not give birth to Jesus. Mary gave birth to the body that housed Jesus. Okay, let me say it again. Mary did not give birth to Jesus. Mary gave birth to the physical body that was branded with the name Jesus. 
In Psalms, he says, a body you have prepared for me. Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. But a body you have prepared for me. What was that body? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's why when Herod wants to kill the body, the body has to be taken to Egypt. Do you think God is afraid of Herod? Why did God demand that that physical body be taken to Egypt? Because it could be killed, right? But you can't kill God who lives in the body, right? But you can destroy the body before it's time. Okay. So they have to protect this body because this body is the Lamb of God crucified before the foundations of the earth. All right? But the God who dwelt in this physical body, Mary had no idea. And one day Mary took it presumptuously. My son, my son. So they came to the temple and they called Jesus out. They said, your mother and your father and your brothers are out there looking for you. And Jesus pulled up a sword and he cut that umbilical cord of familiarity. He says, go tell woman. <laughs> he called a woman. <laughs> woman. My father and mother and brothers are those who do the will of my father. He cut himself from her. He reminded her, you might have given birth to this physical body, but you have no idea who I am. Now, if Jesus has no origin, he has no mother, he has no father, because he is tied to Melchizedek priesthood, it means that he is the father in the physical body. Do you get it? Where do you find the word Trinity anywhere in the Bible? I'll give you a thousand dollars if you can find for me a word Trinity anywhere in your Bible. Find me the word Trinity appearing anywhere in your Bible and you get a thousand dollars from me. The Bible says God is a spirit. Can you see a ghost? Why do we call the Holy Spirit Holy Ghost? Where is he in the Bible called Holy Ghost? Then we draw a dove. Where did the dove idea come from? The Holy Spirit is not even a dove. He says he, he descended on Jesus like a dove. He doesn't say he was a dove. He descended like a. Which means he could have taken the form of a dove. It doesn't mean he is a dove. So people go uh, revering doves. They see white doves and they go, Holy. No. Holy Ghost is not a dove. God is a spirit. Say God is a spirit. But he has a personality. His personality is Jesus. That's why Jesus is the only one who's going to judge you in the end. God will not be judging anybody. God will only judge the sinners. But he has left all the judging to his son. Why? Because his son knows you. He came in the flesh and he was clothed to the flesh just like you. He went through every temptation. He says he was tempted in all areas yet without sin. Can you tempt God? Can God be tempted? Come on people. Reply. Can God be tempted? Jesus was tempted. But God cannot be tempted. Jesus, Jesus grew in wisdom. He asked questions. He had to learn and grow in knowledge. Does God need to grow and learn in knowledge? So are you beginning to see the limitation of God and the divinity of God? The divinity was God who decided to habit that physical body. The personality of God was the limited son that chose to lower himself so that he can serve the greater one. So they made a decision before the foundations of the earth and the son said, I'm going to serve you. He told the father, I'm going, to, I'm going to leave our unity. I'm going to remove myself from you. And I'm going to go down there and I'm going to serve. I'm going to lay my life down for them. And then after I do that work, then I'll come back and join you. That's why Jesus is praying in John chapter 17. And he says, Father, return me back to the glory that we had together before the foundations of the earth. What was the glory that they had before the foundations of the earth? Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. What is the bosom? The bosom is the lower part of the chest. Which means that Jesus was the inner, middle part of God, the soul. 
So when God spoke, his words that were coming out of his mouth, that was Jesus. The word became flesh. Now, I'm speaking, to, I'm speaking to you right now. I have a simple question for you guys. I'm speaking right now. Can you separate my words from me? Can you say that uh, we have Theodore's words, then we have Theodore, and then we have Theodore's body. <laughs> can, can you divide me like that? Theodore the, the, the pastor, Theodore the husband, um, Theodore the, the father, but he's still Theodore, but he has this functions, expressions, things that he's doing, but he's still the same, same Theodore. So, so, so God the Spirit, when he's speaking, the words that are coming out of his mouth, that is Jesus speaking. It's a part of him, but Jesus is the spokes, is the speech of God. Jesus is the speech of God. He's the one who speaks on behalf of the Father. Who is speaking to you right now? My spirit through my soul. So when God speaks, it's the Father through the Son. That's why even when the Son comes, He says you have to ask Father in the name of Jesus, which means He is the middle part that everything must pass through. That's why He is also the veil. If you look at the tabernacle, it's divided into three parts. You cannot experience the fullness of the Shekinah glory without going through the veil. But we know now that that veil was actually Jesus because in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 20, He says, now we can enter boldly through the blood and through the veil which was His flesh. So it means that inside of Jesus, all right, when he was walking on this earth, the Shekinah glory that disappeared from Solomon's temple, that Shekinah glory was now inside of his body. Hallelujah. He can no longer dwell in the Ark of the Covenant, in the mercy seat. He had to go dwell inside the real tabernacle of God. So Jesus stands in front of the temple and says, destroy this temple and I'll build it in three days. He's not talking about the Herod temple. Herod's temple had no presence of God in it. And actually Jesus just went there to whip people out of the temple because they were thieves. He didn't even go in there. He didn't care about that temple because it was built by a wicked man. But he goes there and he says, destroy this temple and I build it in three days. He's talking about himself. He's proclaiming that he is now the full tabernacle of God. Which means that when Jesus is walking on earth, God in his fullness is inside a physical body. Oh, where is that in the Bible, Mr. Preacher? Colossians chapter 2 verses 9. Colossians chapter 2 verses 10. He says, the fullness of God was inside of him in a physical body while he was walking on this earth. He says the fullness of the Godhead was inside of him. Pay attention to those words. The fullness of Godhead. That means that while he was walking on this earth, there was nothing left up in heaven. Somebody say, so then what was remaining in heaven? Mm -mm. You can't put God in a confined space and say that God has a territory in heaven. Because the Bible says that God fills all things with himself. So while he was inside Jesus, he's still filling the heavens and filling everybody else that Jesus has breathed upon. <laughs> Amen. Are you beginning to see the unity of the Father and the Son? So the Son says, I'm going to be the expression of the Father. I'm going to serve in a lower capacity. The lower part of you is the soul. The higher part of you is the spirit. The higher part of the Godhead is God the Father. The lower part of the Godhead is the Son. It doesn't mean that he is lower. It just means that he chose to humble himself to serve. But after serving, he went back and joined the Father. And now the Bible says he has been exalted. And there is no name on earth. His name is higher than any name on earth. Under the earth. Listen, his name is higher than any name in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That means that the name of Jesus is higher than any name, including the name of God. Oh, that sounds tough. No, because the name of Jesus is actually the name of the Father, is the name of the Son, is the name of the Spirit. Jesus is the name of the Father. The brand family name is Jesus. 
So it became Jehovah the Savior through Christ. But it was Jehovah the Creator. He is Elohim, the God family, who chose to serve one another. Jesus comes and serves, and then once Jesus goes up to heaven, the Father is so excited, he says, Wow! You did an amazing job. So this is what I'm going to do. You sit here. And I'm going to go back and enter into all of them. So the Father who is the Holy Spirit comes and dwells every single person who believes in Jesus. Now it's fulfilling John chapter 17 where Jesus prayed and said, I in you, you in me, they in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So, there's no single human being that qualifies to meet those criteria. So, Melchizedek cannot be God the Father. He was the priest of the Most High. What part of your body is the priestly service being offered? What part of your body offers a priestly service to the Lord? Where does your spirit offer the priestly services? I want to see if your imagination is working right. Think about the tabernacle. It is divided into three parts, right? Okay? The outer court, the holy place, and the holies of holies. Where did the priest go to offer sacrifices? Where did he spend most of his time? The holy place, right? Lighting up the lamp, the menorah. The priest, the priest will go at the menorah, will light up the lamps and tend the lamps and make sure that they were burning consistently. Right? He ministered at the table of showbread, which was right, the menorah is right here, the table of the showbread should be somewhere right here. He will go to the table of the showbread and he will offer, uh, he will make sure that the breads are fresh, you know, and then from there he will go to the altar of incense, and this was the last place before God encountered him in the holies of holies. So the altar of incense happened to be the place of the acceptable sacrifices. So this is where the incense or the, fra the fragrance will rise up to God. The priest will be covered in a smoke. Because if he's not covered in a smoke, it could, be, it could be exposed to the presence of God. Which means death. So he had to burn. He had to burn this incense and make sure that the incense was producing a large smoke that hid him. Only then... Did God translate the priest to the holies of holies so that he can continue his ministry over there? So think about it. Where are you offering most of your sacrifices right now as you are waiting for the blessed hope of Christ coming back? Where are you serving? Where are you offering your sacrifices the most inside your body? Your soul. Because Jesus has performed the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice for your spirit. Tell somebody, my spirit has been purchased by Christ. There's nothing I can do about that. Now, now for, 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 for you to offer sacrifices, you don't go offering sacrifices in your spirit because he has already purchased that. There's nothing you can do about that. Now, the only place he wants you to offer sacrifices is you as a priest. Now you're working in your soul. Now you're taking care of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And every day you're learning to submit those areas to what? To the spirit of God. Where is the spirit of God? Inside your spirit. So you are over here at the menorah, tending over your emotions. You're praying that God can regulate your emotions that the seven spirits of God will regulate your emotions you're praying for the spirit of the Lord the spirit of power the spirit of the spirit of the Lord the spirit of power the spirit of wisdom you're praying for the seven spirits of God to begin to regulate your emotions that means that you're going to the table of the showbread and you're praying and you're asking God 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 I pray that you help my help my will so that my will can be not not independent from you but my will can be submitted to you you have to understand that the, the table of the showbread is a picture of a bread from heaven that was broken for us. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the bread that, was, that came from heaven that was broken for us. Jesus is the intercessor, the accepted sacrifice. So listen to what God wants you to do. 
He wants you to make sure that the Holy Spirit regulates your emotions. He wants you to make sure that your will is not independent from Him, but your will is conformed to Him so that you can say like Him on Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done, which means that your will is surrendered, yielded to a higher will. All right? And then He wants you to begin to intercede, which means you cannot intercede if your emotions are raging like a fire. You cannot intercede if your will is completely not under the submission of the Spirit of God. So this is why Satan sneaks into the soul. Because that's where there is warfare. There's no warfare in the Spirit because Jesus has purchased your spirit with his precious blood. But now he wants you to begin to yield to the sanctification process. Which means that you're going to surrender your emotions to the Holy Spirit. When you're tempted to be angry, you're going to refuse to be angry. You're going to subject to the leading of the Spirit so that you can take on the personality of Jesus. You're going to say, Father, I don't want what I want. I want what you want for me. Not my will, but your will be done. Then you're going to be able to stand in the place to be able to intercede for others or to begin to commune with God in a prayer. It's a prayer that is acceptable to God. This is your mind. The altar of incense is a picture of your mind. That your mind must pray the acceptable prayers. Have you ever tried to pray when your mind is traveling all over the place? That's why by the time you stand on the altar of incense, your prayers have been regulated. Your emotions are regulated. Your will is regulated. So by the time you're standing in the altar of incense, that is you're saying, my mind now is in a perfect place. My emotions are not forcing me to think about too many things. The light of Christ is dominating my emotions right now. My will is completely surrendered to the will of God. Therefore, I can pray the right type of prayers. Because then when you pray these prayers, these are the prayers that are God-breathed. These are the prayers that now are influenced by the Holy Spirit. These are the prayers that God lives in. These are the prayers that are full of the breath of God. These are the quickened spirit. This is a quickened spirit in prayer. This is a prayer that is not mechanized. This is a prayer that is God breathed. So when you pray here, God is able to usher you into a deeper dimension behind the veil. And then in behind the veil in the secret place, you can encounter God. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 3 says that Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God. He was made like unto the Son of God who abides a priest, a priestly ministry continually. So Jesus is a priest forever. Melchizedek in him abides the priest perpetually. These two people are one. So in the days of Abraham, it was not the Son of God. Tell somebody, in the days of Abraham, he was not the son of God. Because he had not been born of the Virgin Mary, right? But he was made like unto a son of God in his manifestation to the ancient people. That's why people like Nebuchadnezzar could identify the fourth man in the fire. And they will say the fourth man is like the son of God. How did he know? How did, Melchizedek, uh, how did Nebuchadnezzar how did Nebuchadnezzar figure out that the fourth man in the fire was like a son of God? How did he figure that? Did he know who the son of God is? Did he even know who the son of man is? Did he understand that term, the son of man or the son of God? The fourth man is like the son of God. He's like a son of God. Where did he get that from? Hebrews chapter 10 verses 5 says, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said this. This is what he said when he came into the world. Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. That's Hebrews chapter, chapter 10 verses 5. When he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. What was that body? That is the same body that Mary gave birth to. So Mary gave birth to a body. Mary did not give birth to God. Tell somebody God dwelt in that body. Now there's another trouble. If the blood of Jesus and the blood of Mary can mix together at birth, it disqualifies Jesus from being a savior because Mary is a sinner. 
that's why some people have argued and said there's no way the blood of Mary and the blood of Jesus mixed up at birth because Mary was a sinner. It was born with the Adamic nature. 